today we're going to be talking about Databricks for RStudio users. The goal of today's uh, tutorial is to help our users understand if and how they could do in Databricks the kinds of things they commonly do in RStudio. I point to some frictions that I see as an RStudio user that is new to Databricks. A few of the things that you'd be seeing is to, for example, add folders, R files, and notebooks to your Databricks workspace. Also, we're going to be exploring how to work with Git and GitHub, how to create a Spark, a Spark data frame from a table that exists in the Databricks catalog, how to run jobs, how to create a cluster with RStudio install in it, and a few more things. <coughs> so the audience is specifically analysts who are already using RStudio and are considering if Databricks is a, a complete replacement for RStudio or something that you know, could complement what you already do with it. So why is this important? Well, I think that Databricks is like a racing car. So it's great for racing, <laughs> but for an RStudio user, uh, it may not be the most comfortable kind of everyday car, right? So understanding what you can do and what you shouldn't do in Databricks may, may save you some time and some frustration. So um, let's start exploring uh, what the Databricks environment looks like tab by tab. So let me click here on uh, the Databricks tab and show you, uh, we're going to be kind of navigating through this, this first few tabs that you see here on my left. So the workspace um, gives you access to doing things like, for example, creating a folder. You can come here to the, um, uh, to, uh, sorry, actually, I think I'm not in my workspace. Let's go back here. Uh, so let's go to home. Actually, I think from here it's, it's going to be more natural. There you go. So we have folder um, as an option. So let's do a demo folder. And print it there from from my home, uh, but you will see that uh, it, it you know I created it uh, from the home, but it appears here under my my workspace uh, too. <coughs> so now let's add a file. So we are our users, so let's click on file and add a file dot r, for example. Um, let's do that. Um, and as actually as I speak, um, now that we are here in this r file, I'm gonna connect to a cluster. So um, in our studio, usually, you know, when you create a file, you already have a running environment at the back, right? So you always have your own system or an R server system running in the background, right? So you can, you know, compute things right away. Here, um, the creation of the file and the, and the attachment of that file to a computer environment are two different things. So I'm gonna choose uh, one of the options that I have here, uh, I have two clusters I can connect. If someone created the, it them for me, but I could also create a new cluster if I wanted to. I'm gonna click on, on this first one. Uh, and I do it now because it takes a while. So this is one of the frictions that I experience as someone who is used to kind of jumping right into a, like a running environment and experimenting a few things. Maybe I want to show something like in five seconds. Uh, so now I'll have to wait for a few minutes. So as I speak um, that, I'm gonna also show a few features of uh, the interface that you see when you create an R file. So know, th know that this is a file.r. So the R extension um, tells the rigs that this is an R file and, and the, the interface will behave uh, particularly. So I can click here on the bottom right where it says open bottom panel. <coughs> and what you see here is uh, a tab that says terminal and another tab that says output. So output would be the equivalent to the R console in R Studio and the terminal, the equivalent to the terminal in R Studio. So we run R code here in, in output and we run um, terminal code, like shell code in the terminal tab. Uh, the the um, um, cluster hasn't started yet, it's still working. So I'm gonna start typing something, some R code that uh, we'll be able to run once the cluster is actually started. So let's do uh, the, the typical print, uh, hello world, hello world. Um, and I still am unable to run it. So if I click here, I'll see that it doesn't do, you know, what I wanna do is so cancel current execution. Let's just click there. So in the meantime, I'm gonna show you how to create other types of files and then we can come back to this a little later once this is started. So let's go to workspace again um, and click now here on add. I'm gonna add a notebook. So a notebook will be the closest that you can think of to an R markdown file or a quarter file. So basically, more generally speaking, this is a computational document. Something very, very, very similar to a Jupyter notebook in Python. Uh, so here I could just call it uh, notebook 
and I don't have to give it an extension. Note that by default, now it's giving me R as a language, but you could choose others that you, know, you can set for every single chunk. And then you can, you, know, you also have a language uh, at the chunk by chunk level. Uh, at the very top, what I'm gonna start with is not with R code. I'm gonna start with uh, Markdown, you know, typically, in, in our studio, for example, if you are open a quarto file or, a, or an R Markdown file, you can do something like, you know, pound and hello uh, world to give a title to your file. So here it could be interpreted as an R file. So I have to click there and select Markdown. Now it's going to be interpreted as Markdown file. So note that this um, kind of magic thing here appear automatically when I click on Markdown. So this tells database that it should be interpreted as um, as markdown so if I click uh, if I hit control and enter in my keyword um, I you know inserted that title also is I if I hover here around the middle um, I can already see that I have a plus icon that I can click on and create a new chunk and this time I'm gonna type print uh, as I did before hello world uh, and I'm ready to run this as, um, as an R code, as you can see here. So again, uh, note that um, we don't have a running cluster here where it says connect. <coughs> One interesting thing here compared to our studio is that each file can be attached to the same or a different cluster. Uh, so here I'm gonna choose the same one that you know I selected before. Um, let's see if that started already. Um, I don't see it started here, so I'm gonna leave this as is and maybe go back to uh, my workspace and select my other file, the file of R, um, um, to continue there. So now I see it green, so that means that it's, it's ready to be run. Uh, I'm gonna click here again to show the output and the terminal. So if I click here on the play button, um, it, it can select current show, let's say yes, let's see what happens. Uh, so I'm sending this code you know, to the uh, output uh, little panel. Uh, and, uh, what you see is the output that you would see normally in the R code. Okay? So now that I have a, a running cluster behind this file, I can also click in terminal and I could see um, something useful. Before, remember, it was kind of blank. Uh, so now I can do, I don't know, like an LS to see what files are there or a print WD to see uh, where I'm standing. I'm standing in Databricks driver. Um, that's a little um, surprising, um, you know, to see that the terminal is pointing to a directory, but then kind of coming here in the UI and seeing that if what looks like a file structure is a little different to what I see in the terminal. So that, as an R Studio user, could be surprising. So, um, yeah, just take that. Uh, one other thing I would like to do is to uh, print um, get working directory um, because it you know what it, it happens it can also be a little surprising here you know the r file is running on um, you know, slash temp slash r serve slash con 905 which is a weird directory um, and if i go to my notebook uh, what I, I noticed you know doing some experiment is that the let's, let's try that get wd if i run that it's r code let's run that cell um, I see, hmm, okay, so, ah, right, so, no, the, it, what it was different was not by the file format, but by the language. So notice that in R, I get this weird, um, this weird um, directory, uh, but if I changed this language to say Python, uh, or even the shell that we were playing with before, if I do shell, um, and then I do a print WD, if I run that, um, you know, the file, uh, it's surprising to me to see what you're going to about to see in a moment, that the output of the of print, or, oh, actually, yeah, there you go, it's, uh, it's different, right? So the, the output of um, in current working directory is different by language. So if it's in the shell, it prints, um, that it, I'm in data breaks driver, and if I was in R, as I showed you before, uh, I get something different. So that's something to be aware because if you write code and then maybe in R and you run you source it, you would be uh, using this as a working directory. But if you call it from R script, which uh, is is a command uh, terminal command that allows you to run um, R code, but from terminal, maybe the output is gonna be uh, 
you know, put to a different uh, working directory. So something to keep in mind. Uh, okay, for completion, I'm gonna also print um, "Hello World" by running that chunk. And what I experience also is that if I use Python, also the working directory is similar to the shell, but unlike the one in R. So let's let's try that. Uh, in Python, I will do something like import OS and then and then OS dot get uh, current working directory. Uh, let's change the language to Python and then execute that. Grab that cell. Um, and again, so this is similar to uh, the shell, but unlike R, right? So pretty surprising, something to keep in mind. Uh, all right, so we already learned how to create a file, an R file, a notebook uh, to uh, you know, start the cluster. Let me go back to the notes to see what else I wanted to cover here. Um, I think I think that's all for this section. Uh, let's see if the frictions I cover them all. Well, one, one thing that you will very likely notice is that if you're used to editing text with our studio, uh, you know, the interface that you have here in Databricks is going to feel very limited. The, the amount of you know, refactoring of the text that you can do is, uh, is you know, a lot less powerful. Um, also, it's a few file formats are supported. So if I wanted to create a different type file, so let's go back to my workspace and create, say, uh, let's you know, force it to say like a shell script. I'm gonna do the extension sh. So if I did this in our studio, this would create a shell file, a file that would send commands directly to the terminal. So I could do something like print wd right with that file. But in here, uh, I don't get what I expect. What I get is an error message saying that you know your file has to have extension pi, sql, r, or scala. Uh, because those are the only formats that are supported. So maybe that's a configuration thing. You know, when the cluster are, uh, clusters are created, you can set a few uh, things. Um, maybe that's something that I haven't learned uh, yet how to do, but you know, keep that in mind that maybe by default, uh, not all the, you know, the, the large number of file formats that you're allowed to work with in our studio would be available in Databricks. Uh, all right, so now I think I have covered everything there. Um, yeah, mention the fictions too. Okay, repos. Repos is another. Um, actually, let's, let's copy the, the URL that uh, has the repo I will demonstrate. Uh, so, repos is another tab in, in my workspace. You know, be behind, uh, under my, my workspace, I see repos. If I click there right now, I have my, uh, my user uh, name there and there is no repo. But I click here on add and I can click there on repo and just paste a URL to any repo that I want. So here is the repo uh, where I'm hosting the, the notes that I'm sharing with you today. Uh, so that works pretty, let me see, um, enter a URL, start with this, maybe, yeah, maybe that little space in the beginning was in the way, which is surprising. It's pretty easy to, to remove trailing white space. Surprised that it didn't work. But now, now that I did uh, remove that white space, here we are. Uh, here's the repo that I cloned from GitHub. Uh, what you see here, actually, now this this repo here, and um, actually it's pretty smooth to work with um, with Git here, um, but you know with, with some caveats. Um, for example, one thing we could do is okay, let's um, let's you know um, first go to the Git interface. So I can click here on the dot 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 and go to Git, or I can click on the um, name of the branch. And that will you know, open this interface that where I can do a bunch of things. Like for example, create a branch, and I can call it demo, uh, create branch. Uh, that way, ah, because you know in the previous demo, <laughs> demo one, let's call it, um, I already created a branch with that name. Um, there we are, waiting for a little bit. Uh, I think we are done except that I don't see ah because there is no changes yet okay cool so I think well, I, I see nothing because nothing changed but if I click on a file and then say you know I add you know white space to the end something like this um, now I think that I could you know do that you know, click on the name of the branch and I will see that that file has been modified there you go you see that the white space added here uh, at the end of the file, right? So um, one interesting thing here is that you know the um, notice that when I scroll down a little bit, it says commit and push. So if I do a commit, it will automatically push that commit. So you don't have the chance to uh, create a bunch of commits, maybe rework them, 
uh, before you share them. It's kind of commit and push all the way. So add wait space commit and push. So this is going to be sent to GitHub, and then if I want on GitHub, I could uh, create a pull request out of out of that branch, right? So um, also you can pull, uh, and that's pretty much all you can yeah, you can do. There's no more kind of advanced features for for Git. Um, if you want to, I don't know, reset a commit or rebase a branch, you know, a branch, you know, you, you cannot do that. Right? Although you know, you saw before um, that I was working from the terminal, so you may wonder if I would be able to work with git from the terminal so let's try that and in my experience uh, i think the answer is no so i'm going to go to the workspace navigate to that r file uh, that we created before uh, users there is my username demo i think i can also go to recent that's a nice feature i can just jump to the file from there and uh, so we have a terminal there so we could uh, try to navigate using the terminal to try and navigate to um, to the git repo and, and try to operate the repo from there you would expect that to work as, as an art user that's what you, you would experience in the r studio terminal so let's see if that works uh, let's do um, um, uh, maybe let's see you know first let's show you uh, mls on on the root of the um, file system here so here you see workspace which is something that you know we saw here at the top so let's let's change directory there and go from there now let me clear this up with ctrl l and then cd change working directory to slash capital w work work space <coughs> and then ls it will show that oh there is repos there so i do cd repos and then i'm going to start hitting the tab to auto complete so i'm going to jump inside my um, user account and then one more tab will get me inside the repo so there we are we do ls and exactly you know, there we are you know, confirming that we are in the repo however if i do any git operation like git status for example um, you see an error so uh, what's saying here is um, it's not recognized as a git repo which is obviously um, kind of wrong because it comes from github we know it's a git repo uh, and it says it's stopping at file file system boundary it looks like it's a setup uh, maybe that but you know by default repos are not allowed to be worked on from terminal so they are kind of disabled by maybe removing the dot git directory which is what defines it as a git repo so if i do an ls dot git uh, I, it says that there's no such um, file directory um, so that explains that it doesn't work but you know it's surprising so as a r studio user you would expect that a git repo would behave as a git repo all right so going back to my notes um I think that covers everything I wanted to share uh, on on the repos tab. So let's go now to the catalog. Um, so the catalog um, is this other tab that you see here. There you go. And as you can see, there is a bunch of um, tables really here. So I'm going to click here on the row one. It's one that um, uh, we're going to use for this demo. Uh, here on default, you'll see a bunch of tables. You can search for them say I, wanna, I know one is called country there you go go so I click there on country I already see some properties of the table like the types of columns for example and very nicely I see a create so I'm gonna click there create a notebook notebook from that table what it's gonna do is gonna start a notebook with um, spoiler alert with an SQL um, chunk of code that uh, basically and shows the table you know, on the notebook. It's taking, taking a little while. In the meantime, I'm gonna jump back to my notes to see if there's anything uh, that I could start copying. So, okay, after I show you what I'm about to show you, I'm gonna run this code and explain what that is. This is taking a little longer than I expect. So let's refresh. There you go. Okay, so we are in a new notebook. It's called automatically was def you know the name was defined to explore the you know raw default country, which is kind of the you can think of it as a path to uh, the table. Um, you can run that, and we will see the output. That this is SQL code. Um, you don't have to work with SQL. I'm going to show you that you can do the same thing. R, for example, is add this this chunk here. Uh, uh, and paste the code that I got from that from the notes. So now the path is 
uh, the same that you see here in SQL, you know, I, I put that into a variable called path and I'm using a package called, oh, here it is the, the output of that, of that uh, table, super small table, only five rows. Um, there you are. And it took a, quite a while to, to print though. Okay, so now uh, that I show how to do that in SQL, then uh, let me show you how to do it in R. So this is R, so I'm gonna change that to R. Um, and you see I'm using the Spark R package, um, in particular a, a function called table2df that takes that path. So that path is not a path to the file system as you would normally do it in RStudio, it's a path that um, basically you know, works with the catalog. So Spark R understands that concept of catalog. Um, and in a moment I'm gonna show you where those tables are actually hosted. But let's run, let's run that. It should print something very similar, right, you know, you would expect to um, what you see in a data frame, but uh, you don't because you know uh, the Spark. Um, although I'm not, not going to be talking much about Spark at all, but um, basically Spark allows you to work with big, big, big data. So you know, printing data to the console it might be uh, it might, might print too much uh, data. Uh, so conservatively, it just shows you that it's a Spark data frame. We could you know, do something like class of data, and that will uh, tell us that it's a, a Spark data frame. But then, uh, and that's, you know, class is a function that, you know, you're probably used to using it in, in R. But then other functions that are common, like head, for example, um, may not work. So that means that, you know, Spark data frames are not the same type of data frame that you may be used to working with. So if you're used to working with just normal R data frames, you know, starting to work with uh, Spark uh, is gonna, um, it means that you're gonna need to learn some, some new tricks. Like for example, if you want to display data, you have to call the function display, as opposed to the, you know, just printing the name of the of the table or or using the function print. You know, that that would I'm not sure. I think it's gonna just print what we saw before. Uh, the, yeah, exactly. The, the, just the names of the columns, right? Okay. So in summary, um, you know, working with uh, the catalog, um, you can use Spark R to read the stuff from the catalog in a very simple uh, way, uh, similar to what you would do it in. SQL. Um, I think with Python it's very similar too, but I'm not going to cover that. Uh, and then uh, one friction that I experience is that, well, you know, if you're going to be using Spark um, data frames, then you'll need to learn um, like a new way of, of working with data frames. Um, let's go back to the notes to see what else. Okay, so there is a, a couple other things I want to cover. So one is to read data from the file system. So I did show you that you know, Spark is running um, on, on, on a file system, of course, and, and, and then we could, you know, we could get the things from there. So if you happen to have data uh, in, in somewhere in the file system of Flutterbricks, so remember that at some point I think I show you, and actually this directory, I didn't show you that, but you know, there is one directory called Flutterbricks uh, data set that has a few examples, including one CSV file. So you could, you know, if you have a CSV file and exists in the file system, then your experience could behave as you know, your normal experience in our studio, where you just read things from, from your computer, from your disk. Right? So I'm going to change this chunk to R and run it. Uh, and, and by, you know, because it's just a CSV file in your file system, I can just use the normal tools that I usually use, like read R, for example, read CSV uh, with the path to that, uh, to that data set. It's going to do what you expect. Okay? So if you have normal data, then you can use the normal tools. Uh, um, back to the notes, uh, uh, let me show you where the data that uh, is accessible through the catalog actually lives. So uh, Databricks is uh, nested in, in a bigger framework, which is Azure, uh, in, this, in this particular case. You know, it, I think you can also get Databricks from Amazon, for example, but in this case, you know, I'm accessing it from Azure. And in Azure, I have, um, I know we have a, an account there, and we have what's called their containers, uh, it looks like refresh my browser so what I was showing you before was the portal so the, where you land and oh I think I lost connection to the internet very unfortunate let's see if I can pause the video and recover in a minute okay my internet is back <laughs> I was talking about Azure 
um, here I have a, a container um, that <coughs> here my containers here um, and and in here you can see that that row container that I showed you before so the tables that you saw in the catalog are um, folders here I think they are um, parquet uh, tables uh, and the one we worked with was country this table here so if I click there what you, you see is, is a bunch of files I think that you know make up the uh, the structure of this, this particular type of file there this file format called parquet I think um, but what I wanted to show you is a simpler um, container that has simply CSV files that we can use to well actually I think I removed them unfortunately oh, darn well I think that, that part I'm gonna skip um, basically I, I have a um, container there with a couple of CSV files that I wanted to show you how to read um, but instead I think I'll just need to set with how you could do it so if um, the, the, so the, the package that allows you to uh, read data data from Azure Storage is the packet, package Azure Store with a capital A and a capital S. That's the package you want to use. Um, it needs a token, so I can show you. Uh, I can show you that. So it's best practice to push your your tokens in in an R environment files and not in the script that you share with the world, like I did here in the video. Um, instead, you know the token is. You, know, you can think of it as a password and, and a username all together and uh, it has to go in a, in a file that you don't you know, share with the world uh, and that's the R environment so you can access the R environment file with use this you edit R environment and then you paste um, a token that you get from here so for example if you wanted to uh, if you wanted to read uh, data from say this container then you know you generate an SAS token there um, and I see an error maybe because I don't have privileges to read that particular container but if I create one let's let's just do it oh, something is not working the way I want to so let's try one more time with let's see this ah maybe because I was I had that click now let's try one more time with this other container well basically here in generate SSA uh, you have the interface to generate the tokens that then you paste in uh, your iron iron file and then you have to use the, this URL thing which is um, basically the name of your container so I'm gonna it if, if it's the raw container it would be here you would see raw in my case you know the demo um, ex that I want to show uh, was with a container called test Mauro, right. so that's what you go you put there, and then here what you you put is um, the only thing that changes is is this bit that you get from from here, right? So that's the like the, the storage where all the containers leave. Um, all right, very unfortunate I don't have the demo ready for you, but you know how you could do it is you know you need that URL, you need that token put in your R environment, uh, the name of uh, the variable that will point to that token can be anything I, this is a name that I made up just because it makes sense to me uh, and then you read the value giving it the name of, of the uh, of the variable uh, to the function sysgetinf and that will be uh, you know, read that token privately without showing it here in the you know here in, in the demo or in the file that you share with the world so now the variable SAS contains that secret and you pass it to the function blob container along with the URL. So with that, uh, you have um, created an object of that is a container object. Uh, and now you can pass the path to whatever data exists inside that container. So the demo I wanted to show had a folder called data and inside it a CSV file called iris.csv. Uh, and you read it with a function that comes from the Azure package that is called you know, storage read CSV. Uh, so kind of in a similar note to the one that I made about Spark Data Frames, you know, if you're used to working with uh, your own file system, you know, how to access files from there you know, feels natural to you. Uh, if the files live now in, in a Azure storage, for example, 
then you'll need to learn you know these kinds of tricks to to access the data or maybe you know write a little helper that wraps all this um, code and hide it, hide it from you and, and then you can just call that helper I don't know, read Azure or something like that uh, and then your life will, will be gonna be uh, much simpler all right some of the frictions that I experienced uh, doing this uh, <laughs> beyond the fact that I forgot to uh, re-add the, the demo data that I wanted to show uh, is that uh, spark uh, the spark R package is no longer on CRAN unfortunately it was archived in 2021 for lack of maintenance so I wouldn't trust that blindly um, there is another package called sparkly R um, which seems to be you know, the best alternative uh, and it has an API that is you know, to uh, you know allows you to work with deployer to query data um, but uh, I unfortunately didn't manage to set it up set up seems to be pretty complicated um, and I didn't have time to figure it out so unfortunately I cannot speak for my first hand about my experience about it and then um, finally you know the what I mentioned before that you know if you're gonna be working with spark data frames for example you need to learn the tricks to work with spark data frames or if you, you know, read data from Azure storage you need to learn a little bit about that it's not gonna feel super super natural all right let me um, I still see that there is some problem with the internet here so I'm gonna pause here again and uh, and see if I can figure that out Okay, still fighting against the internet of an airport, maybe not the best place to record this video, sorry. Um, all right, so let's go back to the notes. Uh, we covered <coughs> workflow, we covered, oh no, we did not cover workflows yet. We just you know, finished covering um, the catalog. All right, so what's the workflow? So let's, let's do that. So let's go back to Databricks. Uh, so in, you know, we, we were talking about catalog, now we talk about workflow. So this um, um, tab here allows you, um, let me remove a previous workflow that you know, was prepared for a previous demo. Pre allows you to create what's called, you know, a job. So basically a, a file that you can run uh, on demand or on a schedule. So you, you, you give it a name, say, um, my job, and then you navigate to a notebook whichever it is so I'm gonna use the notebook that uh, we created before the one where we were exploring the table uh, country um, just choose whatever you know s um, notebook that has uh, all the things that you want to do uh, and then you need to choose a cluster and you typically do here you know, that is gonna run that code for you and there you go you, you create the, uh, the job And if you want, you can add another task. We could be, for example, if you have a sequence of files that you want to run uh, one after the other, then you can add a task and then you know, add one after the other. So that's um, in, like a nice graphical way to, to do that. But I don't want to add a second kind of step to my, to my job. I'm gonna just run it now. Uh, and you can view the, the run uh, by clicking there. Uh, and you could see you know, what the output of that of that work is uh, I think this is computing still there you go the first chunk completed the second chunk completed too it says how long it took and then the third one as well going down everything was was done okay so that's um that's workflow so it's not not a lot to it the one thing that I think is a bit of a friction is that uh, I don't see an obvious way to uh, turn that job that we created with the UI. Uh, I don't have s see a way to turn that into text because uh, why would I want to do that? Well, because I would love to add any um, configuration to uh, Git, to source control, so we can review versions of it uh, and, and see the project involved. Uh, that's uh, in, in, for example, if you're used to um, GitHub, then in GitHub Actions you do uh, something very similar with um, to this, right? So you create a workflow, which is simply a YAML file where you specify different, you know, tasks or different jobs that you want to do. And the nice thing about that way is that you know you leave a programmatic record, like code record of of what you're doing, and then if you have to improve the, the workflow, uh, it's easy to you know use Git to see you know how. How you improved it and share it with, with your colleagues so that's one thing that i see here as a, as a downside but again i'm new to databricks 
Uh, so maybe it's just me knowing <coughs> how to do that. <coughs> and finally, I want to talk about compute. So what's the last tab there? Um, so we've been using um, things that you know you create from here, which are these clusters, right? Uh, but now I'm going to show you how to create a, a completely new one. And in particular, I'm going to show you how to create one that has RStudio installed in it. Uh, so if you want your cluster to give you access to an RStudio IDE running on Database, then you need to make sure that, um, at least from what I read in the docs, it has, you know, the ML runtime has RStudio installed in it. So you could choose anything from here that says M M ML. Um, I'm not sure if other things that do not say ML would, would have RStudio installed. Uh, but this one here, I uh, should. Um, I think with what we have here, we are good. But one trick I learned from the docs is that you cannot have this really nice feature that is, uh, allows you to auto-terminate clusters if you are not using them. So basically, in other words, you pay for uh, running containers, for running um, clusters. Uh, so it's kind of nice to have the ability to terminate them automatically if for some time they have been, you know, have been unused. Uh, unfortunately, that's incompatible with our studio, so um, I have to un uncheck that. So I'm going to click here and create compute, and that will uh, will start the process. So the, the um, cluster is still in creation, and so I don't see it right away. But uh, uh, when this is complete, you will see this apps uh, tab um, accessible. So now it's it's kind of not clickable, but it will in a moment. So in the meantime, I'm going to show you. Um, another cluster that this is the one that is already you know, running so if I click on the details for that one you can see that there is an apps button there uh, and, and there's two apps one is the web terminal which is something very similar to what you saw or maybe the same thing that you saw uh, when we were working with our files right and um, so note that these terminals are ephemeral so if you uh, rip you know refresh your browser you lose what you're working with there but it's telling you that if you can if you want you can use tmux to persist terminals uh, and even if you refresh your bra browser or if you close your tab so that's that's one app not the one that fo is the focus of um of what i wanted to say so, but just to show that it's one app. and then the rstudio server appears here but the button is great so the reason why it's, it's great is very likely because this um, cluster has auto terminate enabled so that automatically disables our studio server. So uh, let's go back to compute and see if my other cluster <coughs> is running. No, it's still not running. So what I'm gonna do is pause the video so I don't make you wait. And when it's ready, I'm gonna show you um, this. So when I click here, this apps um, thingy is gonna be active. So let's pause the video for now. Okay, finally it's uh, it's on, it's up now. Uh, you can see that the apps tab is enabled. So I can actually, before I do that, let me just change, I think from here. Can I change the name of my guest or not? Maybe, maybe it's too late now. Um, click here on the apps and you'll see now that RStudio server is, is available. Uh, and, and that's because, uh, remember, an auto-terminate um, checkbox was unchecked. So unfortunately to set up RStudio, uh, I cannot use auto terminate. So by clicking in setup, uh, I have fairly kind of straightforward instructions. All you need to do is to know your you know, username here, and uh, and you know get a password. Just click here on show, get your password copied, and uh, and then you can click here and open our studio. So that will open our studio on uh, a new tab. Uh, the password here probably is the one from the previous uh, run of this demo. Um, I'm not gonna save that. <coughs> and what you will see here is your normal um, RStudio IDE now running on, on the cloud. Right? Uh, <coughs> a couple of caveats here is that the, the terminal lacks sudo. So if you want to do, say, a sudo uh, apt get update, for example, you know, before you install software, typically we run this to update the registries. Um, but here I know I need to get a password and it's not the password I, I can try pasting the password that I copied from from before but it's not that one it's the, the password that gives you admin uh, privileges so uh, by default at least uh, our studio does not give you that power and that's very limiting because usually you do need to change your system uh, to install for example you know our packages that some packages require system level dependencies and so it's very likely that again it's some kind of setup that you can um, configured um, in Databricks to allow our studio to have 
sudo or something that you can change at the level of, of docker container so i'm pretty sure that there is has the ability to add your kind of customized con you know clusters by adding uh, your own um, docker images uh, extending the ones that they maintain that which maintains um, and maybe there you, you know we could enable a sudo but by default at least no so be aware that that, that would be uh, a restriction and also if you did anything here in a studio be aware that if you stop the container and then restart it then what you did here is going to be gone basically you're going to be connected into a completely different uh, instance of our studio so if you create files save data whatever um, it's going to be there so far and you know if if you uh, if you keep that container running but if you stop it then you'll lose it okay so that's another friction to be aware of uh, and with that i think we have covered everything i wanted to cover um just gonna you know, refresh to refresh my brain yeah we talked about okay our studio like sudo at least by default uh, we you know as you requires no determination um st starting the clusters take takes quite a long time uh, also, I think our studio won't have direct access to uh, the database catalog in the same way that you know we had it from from here from the workspace. Um, let's see if we have what's this one here. Yeah, so from here, for example, we read data from the catalog like like this, right? So if what happens if I copy this code and paste it to uh, our studio? Uh, pretty sure it won't work, but let's let's try that. So let's create a new script paste it there and source it yeah so it's not not working right? so yeah it's, you don't have the same uh, direct access to the catalog as you could from uh, from database okay so some other limitations you have to think about all right so that's all i wanted to cover thanks Sven, which is from from two degrees he has you know, answered my many questions <laughs> about database uh, and just to quickly recap you know going up from from the bottom to the top we talked about compute uh, the compute tab you know, basically every tab here right we talked about the compute tab from where you can uh, modify or create um, clusters uh, we talked about workflows like similar to jobs actually like r2 has something called jobs uh, if you don't know that you know you, you may explore the um, ide uh, a little bit more you'll find them here in background jobs uh, it's very similar to that um, the catalog, which is basically like a front end to data living somewhere else, and you know, that always gives you some shortcuts to access uh, those data sets. And then workspace, which is you know very similar to your file system, but with some differences that require you to learn the fruit, tri fruit tricks. In particular, there's one flavor of that, which are repos that allow you to get mm -hmm, um, repos from GitHub, for example, or other um, hosts of um, Git repositories. Um, and, and do some, but not all, uh, um, good actions. All right, thanks a lot.